All right, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we're going to we're going to teach through this chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. To the church at Corinth, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. The church at Corinth was a carnal, baby church. Everybody is a babe in Christ when they first receive the Lord as their Savior. Everyone is a babe in Christ when they are first saved. But as they learn the Word of God, as they grow spiritually, as they mature spiritually, they grow out of infancy into spiritual adulthood. However, there are some Christians who because of their lack of the study of God's word, because of their lack of a willingness to grow as a believer, stay in the baby state all their lives. If we were talking about the biological world, we would call such people as mentally retarded. They are people that do not have the capability mentally to mature and grow as a normal adult would, would do. There, there is something lacking in their brain that keeps them from growing into a mature adult. We understand that from a physical, biological perspective. I'm here to tell you the same problem exists spiritually. In our churches, there are millions of Christians who are retarded spiritually. They've never grown up. They cannot handle the meat of the word. All they know is milk. That's all they will ever know. That's all they want to know. They are children, spiritually, who have never become adults. This is the, the, the image that the Apostle Paul is using to describe these ch church members in Corinth. I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. You never grew up spiritually. I have fed you with milk, spiritual milk, and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. You know why most Christians cannot absorb the meat of the word? Is because they have never grown up spiritually. They've never grown up. It'd be like trying to take a little baby and feed it beefsteak. That baby just could not digest that piece of meat. It's not capable biologically of, of being able to, to eat and digest that kind of food. It requires milk. So too, these Christians who refuse to grow up, who are babies spiritually, cannot absorb or digest spiritual meat. They don't even like the taste of it. They have no desire to absorb it 
because they can't absorb it. The, there's nothing wrong with the meat of the word. There's nothing wrong with the truth of the word. What's wrong is that you're dealing with Christians who refuse to grow up. Now there's a lot of adults in America today who emotionally are, they're not retarded, but they choose to not grow up maturity wise. They're still kids. They want to play games all their life. They act like kids. Truly, they act like kids. They behave like kids. They dress like kids. They act like kids. They act like they're teenagers. They're, they're 50 years old. And they, they act like teenagers. They, they've never grown up emotionally. They've never matured. We have a lot of people like that in America today. Adults who are not adults, they are, they are kids in adults' body. And I'm not talking about retardation. I'm talking about a willful act of immaturity on their part to refuse to take responsibility and act like an adult is supposed to act. <clears throat> Grow up, sir. You're trying to act like a teenager and all you're doing is making a fool out of yourself. Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I acted as a child. But now that I'm a man, I put away childish things. We've got a lot of adults in America today that need to put away the childish things, including in the church. I fed you with milk. You're not able to, to drink, digest meat. For ye are yet carnal. Where, where as there is among you envying, strife, Divisions, are you not carnal and walk as sinful men? The mark of a baby Christian, the mark of an immature Christian, is the presence of envy, strife, and divisions. It doesn't matter what the issue is. It doesn't matter what the issue is. The problem is not the issue. The problem is the immaturity of the believer to handle the issue in a mature, spiritual fashion. The only thing a baby knows to do, an immature child, <clears throat> is to be jealous and strive and have division with their fellow babies. The baby has a toy that they want. They whine and cry and go over and attack the baby that has the toy they want so they can have the toy. Oh, I know your children don't do that. I'm talking about everybody else's kids. They are immature children. They act in an immature way. They are selfish. They are self-centered. They are jealous. Have you ever heard kids, kids can be, kids can be really cruel. And you, you, you boys and girls, you listen to me that are in this room. These boys and girls in this fellowship are more than just a casual friend. 
They are your brother and your sister in Jesus Christ. And how dare you mistreat them? How dare you, because of your jealousy and your immaturity, treat your brothers and sisters in this fellowship with anything less than respect and kindness. Shame on you kids when you use your immaturity and your jealousy and your self-centeredness to deliberately hurt the feelings of another child here in our fellowship. You moms and dads, you need to start teaching your kids right now that those children over there at Liberty Fellowship, they're more than just a casual friend. They are your brother and your sister in Jesus Christ, and you better treat them as a brother and sister in Christ. If we cannot learn to love one another when we're young, how can we be expected to love one another whenever we get older? And that's part of the problem. They never did learn to love one another as a child. Childish, immature Christians are filled with jealousy, strife, division, and selfishness. That's the mark of an immature Christian. And that's the kind of Christians that Paul was addressing in this letter. You are carnal. You're a babe. And here's how I know it. There's division. There's strife. There's discord. I don't know when it started. I, I, you know, in my study of history, I don't know that I've really read much of, of anything about this particular subject. When did the church become carnal? Well, there's always been carnal churches. We know that because the Church of Corinthians, the Church of Corinth was a carnal church. But this was an exception. You read the letters that Paul addressed to the other churches, he doesn't say this. He commends them for their spirituality, for their love, for their boldness and courage, or, or whatever the other characteristics are that Paul lauded. Read the other letters, and they're full of compliments. But to this church, this babyish, selfish church, Paul identifies as carnal. When did the carnal church become the predominant church in America? And it is the predominant church. How many churches do you know that you could walk in and hear a, a message with meat and power without having half the congregation walk out. You go to the average church and what do you hear from the pulpit? You hear nothing but milk, shallow, contentless, milk and people love it and they go back every week and they get more milk more milk more milk and they go to that church for 30 or 40 years and all they've ever had served in that fellowship was milk and if somebody comes in with meat they don't know how to handle it it gets stuck in their throat and they regurgitate and react violently against it. That's the condition of most churches in America today. I don't know what the actual statistic is. I'd be willing to take a guess. It's an educated guess. Nearly half of the churches in this country of various denominations are splits 
from existing churches. And then the churches that split from the initial church, then they have a split. So now you've got a second generation split. And then it's not long, and that church splits. Splits and splits and more splits. And so you go into a town and it has a hundred churches. And half of them or more were splits. Why is that? Because the Christians of those churches are carnal. Division and strife is the mark of carnality. And it infects the church wherever they go. It wasn't always like that. And I don't know when it started. I think it started in the 20th century. As I read about the church in the 19th, 18th, 17th century, 16th century, oh, I know there was division here and there. Don't get me wrong. There, there's always been division here and there. Paul and Barnabas had a division between them, which separated them in ministry for a time. So I, I know that, that that's always been there, but I don't sense in the centuries gone by that we had among the churches what we had in the 20th century and now in the 21st century. I really believe this is a relatively new phenomenon in the body of Christ. And I, I am confident that it is related to everything else that went on in the 20th century and that's still going on in the 21st century. Regardless, it was a carnal church Paul's addressing. Now he continues, verse 4. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulus, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. Listen, the only true increase, spiritually, you can have big buildings, you can have a big crowd, you can have a lot of money, you can have fancy ornaments, and all of the tapestry but if you have real spiritual growth it is exclusively the work of the spirit of the living God it is exclusively the work of the Lord Jesus Christ man cannot take any credit for the true work of God, we are but messengers. We are but servants. God gives the increase. Amen. Say amen. amen. We are living in a day and age in which the flesh is front and center. The flesh is taking all the glory. This is not the work of God. If it's a work of God, it is a spiritual work. And the spiritual is front and center. And God gets all the glory and all the praise. I planted, Apollos watered, 
God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Verse 8, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now, Paul is speaking primarily here of the minister. He that planteth and he that watereth are one. One part of the ministry is not greater than another part. It all works together by the Holy Spirit to accomplish the growth of the believer from an infant baby Christian to a mature adult Christian. The whole concept of the ministry is to make men and women of God. The purpose of the ministry is not building buildings. It's building people. It's getting people off of the milk and onto the meat. It's getting the childishness out of them and replacing it with true manhood and true womanhood in the Spirit of God. That's the goal of the minister. But I want every one of you to know in verse 8 that you are in that verse. Even though it's primarily geared toward the minister, every Christian is impacted by this verse. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Christian friend, you realize, do you not, that one day we are going to stand before God one on one and we're going to give an account of our lives to the Lord? Do you, you understand that, right? Well, a lot of Christians, I don't think, understand it because they don't live like it. We are laborers together with God. I love that. We are laborers together with God. When we are working for God, we are working with God. We are co-laborers with God. He works through us and for us ministering to us, through us. We are partners with him. He is at our side. He is interested in what we are doing for him. He has promised to help in our labor for him. He's not a bystander. He is an active participant in the work of God that he has given to us. We work and labor with him. Co-laborers, ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Now this is where my packages on Israel 1 and Israel 2 come, in, come into to focus here. Because the vast majority of the Christian world has adopted an old covenant mosaic law philosophy including 
the Antichrist goal of building a third Jewish temple in I think it's the first package I have a message entitled a counterfeit temple a counterfeit Israel and I talk about what this verse and others to follow are saying you you believers you the church of the Lord Jesus are God's building there is no such thing as a man-made temple of God in the New Testament church. The temple of God in the Old Testament, the temple built by Solomon, rebuilt by Herod, a physical temple in which initially the presence of God abode was destroyed completely thoroughly destroyed by God in 70 AD the temple of God today is the body of believers within the church. Amen. And by the church, I don't mean a church building. I mean the church collectively that, in, that is a part of the body of Christ. Amen. That is the temple. Any attempt to build a physical building and call it a temple of God is a repudiation of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, the work of the Holy Spirit in forming the body of Christ, the church, and the work of God in the church as the temple of God under the new covenant. In other words, it's sacrilege and blasphemy. You are God's building. Who are these Christians that are aiding and abetting an antichrist building? Who are they? I wonder how many of them would be as enthusiastic to build the Antichrist temple, which is exactly what it is, if they thought they might still be around when the Antichrist comes to power and starts doing his thing in the world. But they've got an easy out. Oh, we're all going to be raptured before all the bad stuff happens. Now we're gonna help all the bad stuff come about. You gotta follow this. You mean, we're gonna assist the Antichrist and help him build his temple and they all admit that it will be the place in which the Antichrist takes power. They all admit that. But they're helping him, the Antichrist, build his temple. And then when the Antichrist comes to power and starts killing 80% of the world's population, which is what they believe is going to happen, they won't be here. 
thank you very much. They're going to get raptured to heaven and let the rest of the world have to deal with what they helped bring about. And then they piously say, oh, like the letter we read earlier, oh, Brother Chuck, what God's going to do, God's going to do, we can't do anything to change it. Then why are you working so hard to make it happen? If you really believe there's nothing you can do about it one way or the other, then why don't you just sit back and do nothing and let it happen? But you don't, do you? You help. You assist. You give money to those Zionists in Israel you buy those little coins with Cyrus's face on, on the one side and Donald Trump's face on the other side to help them build the Antichrist temple. You go to a church where the man in the pulpit gets up and encourages you to help the Zionists in the counterfeit state of Israel to wage war against its enemies, aggressive, offensive war against its so-called enemies in order to expand its territory to make it match the original promised land that was promised to Moses and Joshua and by the way, fulfilled under the reign of David and Solomon. So why are you doing all of this? If there's nothing we can do for or against whatever God's going to do, then why are you so actively engaged in helping the Antichrist. Do you see the nonsensicalness of this? Do you see how patently unscriptural this is? We are commanded to resist the devil. We are commanded, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. But they won't do that. They're helping the Antichrist. And then they're going to fly away. And by the way, I like the song. I love the song. Don't stop singing that song around here. Who, the, Sarah, the, just... Is that what I'm talking about? These Christians think they're going to escape the consequences of their actions. And they are not. We are going to receive the reward according to our own labor. And these people that are working for the Antichrist system are going to reap the reward of their labor. Now, verse 10 and following, we are introduced to the judgment seat of Christ. According to the grace of God given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Another buildeth thereon. Let every man take heed how he build thereon. Verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If you're building your life 
on anything other than Jesus Christ, your work is futile. The only foundation that we can build our lives, our work upon is the Lord Jesus Christ. You build it on yourself, it's futile work, it's a wasted life. No man can build on the foundation except Jesus Christ. Now, be careful how you build. If any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, to groups, if you would, of works. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. <clears throat> now notice Paul is talking about the trial of our works. He's not talking about the trial of our soul. He's talking about the works that we built as believers. He's talking to believers here. He's not talking to the unsaved. If you as a believer build gold, silver, precious stone, you are going to receive a reward. If you build upon that foundation wood, hay, and stubble, the fire will burn it up and you will suffer loss. Now, First of all, before I go too much further, let me read Albert Barnes on verse 13. The fire which is here referred to is doubtless that which shall attend the, co the consummation of all things, the close of the world. That the world shall be destroyed by fire, and that the solemnities of the judgment shall be ushered in by a universal conflagration is fully and frequently revealed. The burning fires of that day, Paul says, shall reveal the character of every man's work. As fire sheds light on all around and discloses the true nature of things. It may be observed, however, that many suppose that this referred to the fire of persecution. Others suppose that the apostle refers to the approaching destruction of Jerusalem. <coughs> I find it absolutely incredible how many references there are in the Word of God and in the commentators of, of the old 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century Christian writers to the destruction of Jerusalem. You can sit in a modern evangelical church all of your life today and never once hear the reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. Never one time. You can read all of the commentaries that you could buy at a Christian bookstore in the 20th century and now 21st century and never once read in those commentaries a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. Yet in the New Testament, the references, both obvious and not as obvious, to the destruction of Jerusalem are manifold. Scores and scores of references to the destruction of Jerusalem. When you read the writings of these great Bible teachers hundreds of years ago, they were full of the references to the destruction of Jerusalem. Here is such a point. Barnes is saying he believes this fire is the fire that is, going, that is going to accompany the end of the, of the world when God brings the final judgment upon man and Christians will be given an account to the Lord. But he said, you know, there are other Bible teachers 
who believe that this is referring to the dis approaching destruction of Jerusalem. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Others, still quoting now, as Grotius, Hugo Grotius, say we'll write him in a minute, suppose that the reference is to time in general. It shall be declared ere long. It shall be seen whether those things which were built on the true foundation are true by the test of time, etc. Regardless of which of those exact interpretations is applicable specifically, the fact remains the Christian is going to face the Lord in a judgment in which his works will be judged and God, the works that God determines are gold, silver, and precious stone are going to abide the fire and they will be rewarded for those works. The works that are typified by wood, hay, and stubble subject to burning are going to be burnt in the mind and the eyes of God and they will not have reward for their labor. Let's keep reading. Every man's work shall be made manifest, verse 13. Verse 14, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. He's not talking about determining whether a Christian is going to heaven or hell. That's not the issue here. The issue is not if your good works outweigh your bad, you go to heaven. If your bad works outweigh your good, you go to hell. That's not the case. If that were the case, no one, save Jesus, would go to heaven. Right. Talking about the works of the Christian. All of our works that were not done for God properly will burn up in this judgment, figuratively speaking, and we will suffer loss, the loss of reward. God wants to reward us for our labor, and he will reward us for our labor. But if we did not build our lives properly with the works that God considers gold, silver, and precious stone, our works are going to burn up and we will suffer the loss of reward. Now we, do, we need to think about this because when we stand before God one day, how are we going to feel when we watch our life's work burn up before our eyes and we are left with nothing or little that our Lord can reward us for? We're in the flesh today. We don't see things and understand things like we will when we stand before the Lord in a glorified, sinless body. We will see him face to face, whereas now we see through a glass darkly. We see him with the eye of faith one day our eyes will see him face to face. We will understand like we've never understood his love for us. What he did on the cross for us. What the Holy Spirit has done for us the goodness of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. We are going to understand it. We're going to see him. We're going to see his scars that he took for us. At that moment, 
we will want to serve him with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, forever and ever. And then we're going to see our works <clears throat> burn in front of our eyes to ashes with nothing or little for God to reward. You talk about the ultimate embarrassment. That will be the ultimate embarrassment of our lives. If those works that God deems to be gold, silver, and precious stone, again, he's speaking in terms that we can understand, which will survive the test of the fire, then we will hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and we will receive the reward from him, whatever that reward is. Let me tell you what, when we get to heaven, there's going to be no such thing as egalitarianism. The only thing that we are absolutely equal in is that we are all saved by grace through faith, Minus and plus nothing. We're all equal in salvation. We're equal at the cross. But when it comes to the rewards that we will receive or not receive in heaven, it will be totally dependent upon what we did in this life. Now, I can't leave verse 15 without making this remark from Albert Barnes again. The apostle, if any man's work, shall be burned, etc. The apostle does not say that Christians will be doomed to the fires of purgatory, nor that they will pass through fire, nor that they will be exposed to pains and punishment at all, but he simply carries out the figure, the analogy that he is creating for us so we can understand, which he commenced, and says that, that they will be saved as if the action of fire had been felt on the edifice of which he is speaking. That is, as fire would consume the wood, hay, and stubble, so on the great day everything that is erroneous and imperfect in Christians shall be removed and that which is true and genuine shall be preserved as if it had passed through as if it had passed through fire their whole character and opinions shall be investigated and that which is good shall be approved and that which is false and erroneous will be removed there is no verse anywhere in the scripture that teaches the existence of purgatory and our dear Catholic friends that have been brought up under this false teaching that after you die, you go to purgatory and then someone who remains will pay so much money to the church to pray you out of purgatory is a false doctrine. When we die there is no limbo there is no purgatory absent from the body if we are saved present with the Lord if we are not saved absent from the body is as the rich man in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment we will go to heaven or hell upon our death dependent upon our personal faith or lack thereof in the Lord Jesus Christ, period. There is nothing after the grave to help you. You either leave this earth saved, a child of God, to enjoy the bliss of heaven forever, or you, or you leave this earth an enemy of God, a child of the devil, 
and plummet to the pains of hell, there to abide forever. And there is no one, priest or otherwise, that will have the power to pray you out of some place into heaven after you die. If you get saved, you're going to get saved of your own accord, of your own self, responding to the grace of God and the call of the Holy Spirit upon your life. No one else is going to do it for you. If you don't know Christ in this room or out online, you need to receive and trust him as Savior. If the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to your heart about your need for salvation, you need to trust him as your Savior right now. There's only one who can save you, and it's not a priest, and it's not a preacher, and it's not a rabbi, and it's not an imam. There's only one person who can save you, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, Messiah and Savior of the world. Trust him. So Albert Barnes is right to point out in this passage that this is not talking about purgatory. But this is one of the verses that the Roman church uses to try and prove purgatory. And you can see the foolishness of that. So our works will be tried. Our works will be judged by God. Let me tell you what. There's going to be a lot of embarrassed, ashamed Christians at that day. I don't want to be one of them. Do you? So that means you need to build your life on the foundation of Christ according to the works that God describes as gold, silver, and precious stone. Your motives, your attitudes, your actions should all be for his honor and for his glory. Now verse 17, no, excuse me, verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. That goes back to the point we made about our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. I, I, uh, I can't fathom these Christians and especially these preachers that are going along with this building a third Jewish temple nonsense in light of the New Testament scripture. But you see what they're doing. They have fallen into this trap that God has a special covenant for Israel or for the Jews. That the Jews don't have to trust Christ as Savior. They, they're going to go to heaven anyway. And that the temple is for the Jews and it's a special covenant with them. They do not see what Jesus did on the cross. I've had so many preachers rebuke me for my position on this subject. And I tell you the truth, these preachers are blind to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. When you come down to the final analysis, the bottom line, of this issue. It's not about Israel. It's not about the Jews. It's not about the Antichrist. It's all these things are peripheral issues. The singular issue is the finished work of Christ on the cross. Either Jesus finished it or he didn't. Either Jesus completed it or he didn't. Either Jesus finished everything relative to all of this on the cross, or he didn't. If he didn't, all right, you may have a point. If Jesus finished it all on the cross, 
There is nothing left to finish. <clears throat> and all this stuff that we're dealing with today about this counterfeit Israel and this counterfeit temple and us counterfeit covenant and and, and the Israel 1948, that state of Israel created, and all this, all it is, is a failure to understand that, as the songwriter said so many years ago, Jesus paid it all. Jesus finished it all. He said it on the cross before he died. It is Finished! Everything about it is finished! But this, all these works are a proof that these people do not understand that Jesus finished it. Therefore, this is not about, in, in, and we're going to talk about prophecy in days to come. And we've talked a lot about Israel and the, our Israel packages. Very important. But the bottom line issue of it is you either accept Jesus' finished work on the cross or you don't. Amen. And if you don't, that's where all of this stuff comes from. Why well, we have to do this and we have to do that and the Antichrist has to do that. And the Jews have to do this. And the state of Israel has to do that. And we have to... No, 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 no! It's finished. And with the new covenant that God gave to us through his death, resurrection, and the gift of the Holy Spirit, there is neither Jew nor Gentile we are all one in Christ and everyone who is in Christ is a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in us. Barnes says the figurative sense is if any man by his doctrines or precepts shall pursue such a course excuse me, verse 17, I got ahead of myself. This is, the, this is the part. If any man defile the temple of God, what's the temple of God? The body of Christ. Him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. If any man defile the temple. Okay, listen carefully. Albert Barnes, the apostle does not say that Christians will be doomed, excuse me, that's verse 15. The figurative sense is, if any man by his doctrines or precepts shall pursue such a course as tends to destroy the church, God shall severely punish him. Let me read that again. If any man by his doctrines or precepts shall pursue such a course as tends to destroy the church, God shall severely punish him him for the temple of God is holy the temple of God is to be regarded that is the body of Christ as sacred and inviolable that means unbreakable this was unquestionably the common opinion among the Jews respecting the temple of Jerusalem and it was the common doctrine of the Gentiles respecting their temples they considered their temples as sacred. 
The body of Christ is sacred. Sacred places were regarded as inviolable. And this general truth Paul applies to the Christian church in general. Locke, still quoting, Locke, John Locke, supposes that Paul had particular reference here to the false teachers in Corinth. But the expression, if any man, is equally applicable to all other false teachers as to him. The doctrines of men that tend to harm the sacredness, the sanctity of the body of Christ, the temple of God in this new covenant, God will destroy. Think about how many doctrines of men there are today that are either overtly or covertly doing harm to the body of Christ. Any doctrine that opposes the truth pertaining to the body of Christ, God's temple, would apply to this warning. Think about, I don't know, time gets away from me. <clears throat> when you think about the doctrines that attack the sanctity of the body of Christ, which is the temple of God in the new covenant, it staggers the imagination to try and count them. Any attempt to add works to the work of Christ in forming the body of Christ is an assault against the body of Christ. Any attempt to make another temple equal in sanctity, in sacredness to the body of Christ, the temple of God. is an affront to God's temple and invites God's judgment. All of these issues that we are dealing with relative to Israel, all the things I've discussed in these 22 or 23 messages, and as you watch and as you understand the truth of it, the light will reveal all of this to you. It comes down to a devilish attempt to demean and lessen the value and the importance of Christ's work on the cross and the new temple that he has created in this new covenant, which is the body of Christ, a temple not made with hands. <clears throat> so when you understand that you can understand that all of these false doctrines are more than just 
innocent misinterpretation. <clears throat> they are blatant assaults against the sanctity and the sacredness of the holy temple that Christ created through his death and resurrection and that the Holy Spirit created through the church which is the body and temple of God. Do you understand what I'm telling you? <clears throat> now before I finish this message, I want to put a caveat in here, or a parenthesis would be a better word. Barnes referred in this comment to John Locke. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I have told you this before, but if I passed out a piece of paper and, and made it a test, I don't know how many of you would remember and would pass the test. So I'm going to tell you again. The five most influential natural law philosophers on America's founding fathers, who were they? In your mind, try to answer them. I've already told you this. The five most influential natural law philosophers on America's founding fathers. Number one, Hugo Grotius. Hey, that name sound familiar? We just heard Albert Barnes quote from Grotius a few verses ago. Number two, John Locke. He quotes John Locke in this verse, commentary. Number three, Samuel von Pufendorf. Surely you can remember that name. I mean, how can you forget that name? Pufendorf. Number four, Charles de Montague. And number five, Emer D. Vittel. Those are the five most influential natural law philosophers on our founding fathers. Notice the atheist-based philosophers, Voltaire, Rousseau, and others like them, were not included in the list. There are two groups of natural law philosophers. The atheistic, humanistic natural law philosophers like Voltaire and Rousseau, and the theistic, God-based natural law philosophers like Grotius, Locke, Pufendorf, Patel, etc. The secularists today that love to quote the Enlightenment fathers and they quote natural law, you may be confused. Well, how can these atheists, secularists that despise God and God's laws, how can they be talking about natural law? And then I hear Pastor Baldwin talking about natural law from the pulpit. You've got to understand there's two types of natural law. One is theistic based and the other is atheistic based. The atheistic based philosophers use natural law as an excuse to avoid the laws of God. The theistic based, God based natural law philosophers understood and accepted the laws of God and understood how God created natural law in man and recognized God's place in natural law, which makes it absolutely as it was intended to be. So you have to understand that distinction whenever you hear people talk about natural law and, and the Enlightenment philosophers. Well, which ones are you talking about? You gotta, you gotta make that distinction. The atheist-based philosophers were not the ones that influenced America's founding fathers. Now, they did influence the French Revolution. The French Revolution was a godless, faithless system of liberty of which there cannot be 
liberty. There is no liberty without God. You try to bring liberty without God and all you're going to get is tyranny. Anyway, the Enlightenment God-based natural law, 16th century, 1500s when it started, was the antidote to the 13th century Renaissance humanism. The Renaissance humanism was a godless, atheistic system of reason that dominated Europe for 300 years until the Enlightenment philosophers came along. The first one was Hugo Grotius in the 1500s. And then after the Enlightenment philosophers began to dominate the thinking of Europe, the, the old antiquated Renaissance humanism was pushed aside. At the same time, now, now follow this, at the same time, 16th century, the Protestant Reformation took place, which was the antidote to the bondage of Romanism. Think about it. <clears throat> Natural law, enlightenment, occurred at the same time as the Protestant Reformation. The one appealed to the mind of man. The other appealed to the heart of man. But both the natural law of God-based of God-based Enlightenment philosophers and the Protestant Reformation of the Reformers, both through the mind and through the heart, took man back to his creator, God. The result of the Protestant Reformation and the Enlightenment natural law philosophy, both occurring starting in the 16th century, the product, the result of both was the United States of America. The United States of America is the culmination, the product of the Enlightenment natural law, God-based philosophers, and the Protestant Reformation coming together in one nation, in one group of founders who created, and I'm sorry, America was not founded on Talmudic Noahide laws. America was founded on the Reformation theology and natural law philosophy. That was what founded the United States of America. <clears throat> Now I want to show you something. Hugo Grotius, called the father of natural law philosophers, that's the title that history has given him. He was basically the first one. He was the John Wycliffe of the Reformation. He lived from 1583 to 1645. He wrote two monumental books that every library should have. The Rights of War and Peace, and The Truth of the Christian Religion. If you don't have those two books, whatever you got to do, you find them and buy them. The great commentators of the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries that I refer to often in my preaching quoted Hugo Grotius, often, listen to this, 
I just selected six of the commentaries that I use. Albert Barnes is the one I'm using today. 1798 to 1870. He quoted Hugo Grotius 297 times in his commentaries. <clears throat> Adam Clark, 1760 to 1832. He quoted Grotius 54 times. John Gill, 1697 to 1771, the predecessor of the great Charles Spurgeon. He quoted Grotius 293 times. Matthew Henry, 1662 to 1714, he quoted Grotius 41 times. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, three men, 1802 to 1910, they quoted Grotius 200. 97 times. Kyle and Dietrich, two commentators, 1807 to 1890, they quoted Grotius 92 times. Do you, do you see that? Do you see how many times they quote, how influential this natural law grandfather was to the Bible commentators? in the 16, 17, 18, 19 hundreds. 18th, 19th century, I mean. John Locke, 1632 to 1704. The father of America's founding fathers is the title. History is given to John Locke. Thomas Jefferson quoted almost verbatim in certain parts of the Declaration of Independence. When you read, we carry John Locke's book the Second Treatise of Government. Over, over there on the table. It's online. When you read John Locke, you're going to swear you are reading Thomas Jefferson. John Locke. Barnes quotes him 72 times. Clark, 11 times. Henry, 2 times. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, 4 times. Montesquieu, 1689 to 1755. He wrote The Spirit of Laws. These are the books that you need to read to understand the basis of American civilization. Montesquieu, Barnes quotes him once, Clark quotes him once. The point I'm trying to show you is the influence that these God-based natural law philosophers had on the church before the 20th century. On the church. That's why whenever Jefferson says in the, in the Declaration, the statements that he said that all men are created equal, that we are all, uh, on the rights given to us by God, <clears throat> the, the duties of men under nature to hold government accountable to these all, all these things the early Christians of America in the colonies of New England understood it perfectly because they had been taught it for generations by the pulpits of this country are you with me do you understand yeah, yeah. you get to the 20th century and what happens well, the state of Israel is born, and now there's almost no mention whatsoever of the God-based natural law philosophers, none. No reference to Locke, Grotius, Montesquieu, Patel, none. That these are unknown figures of history that have never been read. The preachers know nothing about them. They don't read commentators like I read and give to you. They read modern 20th century commentators who have totally rejected and repudiated Reformation theology as evidenced by the founders of Reformation and the natural law philosophers who were saying basically 
the same thing except from a philosophical mind perspective rather than a spiritual faith perspective. But both perspectives, mind and heart, were taking men back to their creator. They're, we're not doing that now. We're not doing that now. They're not talking about taking men back to their creator, back to the cross. They're talking about futurism. I, I, please stay with me. They're talking futurism. They, they, they interpret everything in the Bible as something in the future. It's all future. I mean, you, you listen to them. You listen, if, you, if you watch TBN, well, if you watch TBN, you're wasting time. But if you watch TBN, you will listen to these fellas and gals saying, they'll take verses and they will, oh, this is happening today. This is happening today. Oh, this is going to happen tomorrow. Oh, this is going to happen next. Oh, this is happening in the future. It's all future-based future stuff there is no foundation to get the foundation of what the Bible is saying to us today so to teach us how we are to live today how we are to react today how we are to live our lives today we must go back to the foundation God gave us in his word You can make a verse say anything you want if it's going to happen tomorrow. Right? Oh, this verse, then this is tomorrow. You can make the Bible say anything you want if you're talking about the future. How are you going to gauge the accuracy? of what you're saying. It's never happened yet. Most, this is a preview of things to come. Most, not all, most of the prophecies of the Bible, Old and New Testaments, have already happened. These people are making stuff up. And it's silly, gibberish, garbage. I don't have any idea where that phrase came from. I just made it up. I just made it up. But that's what it is. They have no basis of fact predicated upon the truth of God's word as given to us in the Holy Scriptures. They make stuff up. That's how important Reformation theology, natural law philosophy, God-based, is to the understanding of what God has already done for us through his work on the cross and the new covenant which gave us the body of Christ as the new covenant temple of God. That's how important it is to understand this. Now, with the time I have left, verses 18 through 20. Now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. Oops, excuse me, wrong, wrong verse. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. 
For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. I want to, I want to leave you with this. I hear so many of these legalistic Christians. And I know a little bit about this because I came out of legalism. I know what it's like and I know what it teaches. They judge people's spirituality based upon appearances. Your haircut, your attire. I don't know how many sermons I've heard in my life about how women shouldn't wear this and how men shouldn't have this and, and if you do, then you are carnal, blah, 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 blah. They talk often in their messages about worldliness. You'll hear that a lot. Worldliness. And to them, it usually has something to do with the way you dress. Or if you listen to country music. <laughs> you folks that have been trapped in that, you know what I'm talking about. Worldliness more than anything else is a condition of the heart and of the mind. Now I'm going to give you some things here that will help you maybe see the application of this. And I'm going to use apparel as a starting point, but not what you think. Worldliness. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. If any of you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, and then he'll be wise. Let me give you some points to ponder. Let's talk about apparel. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. No true Christian could doubt the importance of that statement from the Apostle Paul. A Christian lady should dress in modest apparel, not flaunting her flesh, but modestly dressed. That is a A, a, a norm for Christian behavior from the beginning of the church age. But here's the part that you never hear. The next part of the verse. Not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. I cannot count the number of Christians who boast about their wealth, 
who take pictures of their multi-million dollar mansions and put it on Facebook, all the while claiming to be a great Christian. They take pictures of their families in attire, dresses, suits, shoes, etc. that cost tens of thousands of dollars. And they flaunt their wealth. They brag about their wealth. And of course we have an entire sect of Christianity that bases its entire existence on the accumulation of wealth. The Kenneth Copeland type. They brag about their material wealth. They brag about their jet airplanes and their fancy cars and Closets full of expensive clothing, and they get up and they brag about it. That's worldliness. I'm not talking about people that have made an honest living and have have God has blessed in a way that they've. They have accumulated a lot of wealth, but they've put God first. And they're humble. And they serve God. And money is not the object. Serving God is the object. Being true to God is the object. They just use their talents and their abilities to the best of their ability, like every one of us should. And God blessed it above and beyond what he does for most people. So be it. God bless them. To whom much is given, much shall be required. I'm talking about the people that boast in their wealth. Who flaunt their wealth. That is worldliness. That's what the world does. The world lives for money. The world flaunts wealth. The world lives for success. The world lives for fancy cars and nice homes and all. That's what the world lives for. That's not what a Christian is supposed to live for. That's worldliness. I'll give you another indicator. James chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. The lust for war is an indication of worldliness, a worldly spirit. Who are, the, who are the people that are clamoring for war more than anyone else in our country? You know who it is. Who is it? Evangelical Christians. If the evangelical Christians would stop clamoring for war, we wouldn't be at war all the time. They love Mike Pompeo. Because he's a warmonger. They loved John Bolton because he's a warmonger. They love Lindsey Graham because he's a warmonger. Any politician who is a warmonger, evangelical Christians automatically love them. Warmongers. 
Whence come wars and fight in some way? Oh, there come the lust that war in your members. The lust for war. <clears throat> it's worldliness. James 4 3. <clears throat> You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts, the lust for worldly things. Worldly things. What makes you happy? Worldly things. What's on your list of things you just have to have? Worldly things. Wait a minute. How's your Christian life doing? How's your walk with God doing? How's your spiritual growth doing? How's your prayer life doing? How's your study of the Word doing? How's your understanding of the Word doing? Worldly things. Worldliness. James chapter 4, verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses. Boy, I hear Christians using this verse for anything they want. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. James is saying there in that passage, that an adulterer and adulteress is someone who is a Christian who is a friend of the world. God looks at us as his bride. He wants us to be true to him. And when he sees us flirting with the world, when he sees us collaborating with the world, when he sees us accepting the world's philosophies and the world's knowledge, he says we are adulterers and adulteresses. Boy, you won't hear too many Christians talk about that, will you? That's what he's talking about. Most of the Churches in America today are predicated on worldly philosophy. They use worldly tactics and strategies on how to grow bigger and how to get more money and how to add more staff and how to have more programs. And they, they get books and magazines. They have conferences where, where speakers come and pump everybody up and teach people how to, how to do it, how to get bigger, how to get richer, how to get more, nor, more notoriety, how to become more popular in the community. I'm, I know what I'm talking about. I've been there. I've bought the books, subscribed to the magazines, heard the speakers. I know what they say. It's all worldly philosophy. Avoid these things because that's not going to go over well with people and you're not going to keep them if you say that or say this or do this or do that. But you got to do it, got to be sure and do this because people like that, people like this over here. So be sure to, it's all, it's all human psychology, human philosophy, human strategy. It's, it's the same kind of stuff that you would read in any business magazine or in any business conference whenever you get a bunch of business people together talking about how to get richer, how to expand your business, how to get more customers, how to keep your customers. It's the same exact philosophy. It's worldliness. Most of our churches today are up to their eyeballs in worldly philosophies. That's not what we're about. That's not what the church is about. That's not what the body of Christ is about. That's why Paul said, if any of you seem it to be wise, let him become a fool. In other words, 
When you are, when you reject the philosophy of the world and you accept the Spirit of God and the philosophy of Christ, the world is going to consider you a fool. The world is going to consider you an idiot. So if you are really wise in God's eyes, you will be a fool in the eyes of the world. They will reject your methods, your strategy, your message. Every, this, that is foolish. That is idiocy. So if you want to follow God, then you need to be prepared to be thought a fool by the world. If you want to be thought wise by the world, then that means that you are not wise in the eyes of God. You can't be both. You can't be both. Verse 21, and I'll leave you with this. Therefore, let no man glory in men. <clears throat> okay, I'm just going to say it. <clears throat> the politics of America has become its religion. Politics is more important than the church. It's more important than the preacher. It's more important than the sermon. It's more important than the Bible. It's more important than faith. Politics is the God of this country. On both sides of the aisle, Be not, therefore let no man glory in men. <laughs> Tell that to the average Christian and watch him punch you in the face. The Christians of the political right have made a god out of Donald Trump. The Christians of the political left made a God out of Barack Obama. In the eyes of the political left, Barack Obama could have done nothing, nothing that would have caused them to not support him. In the eyes of the political right, Donald Trump can do nothing that will cause them not to support him. All this impeachment stuff, let me tell you, as far as I'm concerned, Donald Trump deserved to be impeached before he even took office. That's how I feel about it. During the 2016 campaign, he bribed two prostitutes in order to buy their silence so he could be elected. In my opinion, that was an impeachable offense. All this stuff that's going on right now about the potential impeachment I'm not sure that we've had a president in my lifetime that didn't deserve to be impeached. As far as I'm concerned, when Donald Trump bombed Syria without the approval of the U.S. Congress and a declaration of war, that was an impeachable offense. But he's not being impeached for that if he is going to be impeached, and that's still not a done deal. When Bill Clinton was collaborating with communist China, and Hillary was collaborating with communist China, 
I was on the radio in my national broadcast back in those days saying that Bill Clinton deserved to be impeached, but he wasn't impeached for that. Here's the bottom line. If you are on the political right, the Republican can do nothing that will cause you to lose your support. It doesn't matter whether it's constitutional or not. If you're on the political left, the Democrat can do nothing that will cost you to lose your support. It doesn't matter whether it's constitutional or not. It's all about your guy staying in power. Not about right and wrong. It's not about constitutional or unconstitutional. It's not about moral or immoral. It's all about partisan politics. That's all it's, that's all it's about. It's all about partisan politics. And you watch. If they go through with this impeachment, which they may not, but if the Democrats go through with this impeachment, wait till in the near future, whenever you have a Democrat in the White House and a Republican in the House of Representatives, guess what's going to happen? Oh, yeah. There'll be impeachment. And it's not about right and wrong. It's not about constitutional or unconstitutional. It's all about partisan politics. If that's the way the world wants to play their game, so be it. If that's the way unsaved, unredeemed men want to behave, so be it. It's going to eventually cost us our, our country, if, if it hasn't already. This left-right paradigm, this false, phony, left-right, Democrat, Republican paradigm, it's a curse to our country. But let, let the unsaved world play that game. Let them do it. We, who are in the body of Christ, we answer to a different calling. We march under a different banner. We have a different set of conduct expected of us. I'll end with this. As Americans... I'm going on the verse, let no man glory in men. As Americans, we should glory in liberty and constitutional government. Amen. Not politicians. And as Christians, we should glory in Christ and biblical truth. Not denominations and TV Amen. preachers. Let's stand for prayer.